Hi, everyone, and welcome and good evening. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so excited to introduce this virtual event with Catherine Page Harden, presenting her book, The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality, in conversation with Benjamin Neal. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Tuesday, March 15th, we'll host celebrated neuroscientist Neil Seth for his new book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, in conversation with Harvard's Gregory Keston. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our science research public lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll shortly be posting a link to purchase the genetic lottery on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help and help ensure the future of a landmark independent and largely and proudly unionized bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you may have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. Now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Catherine Page Harden is a tenured professor in the Department of Psychology at UT Austin, where she leads the Developmental Behavior Genetics Lab and co-directs the Texas Twin Project. Dr. Harden has published over 100 scientific articles on genetic influences on complex human behavior, and her research has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, Huffington Post, among others. Tonight, Paige is joined in conversation by Benjamin Neal, co-director of the program in medical and population genetics at the Broad Institute and director of genetics at the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research. In addition to his work at the Broad, Dr. Neal is an associate professor in the analytic and translational genetics unit of Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as an associate professor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. This evening, Paige and Ben have joined us for a discussion of the genetic lottery, a stirring introduction to the latest developments in genetic research, which Angela Duckworth, the best-selling author of Grit, calls, without a doubt, the very best exposition on our genes, how they influence quite literally everything about us, and why this means we should care more, not less, about the societal structures in which we live. Weaving together both the personal and the scientific, this groundbreaking book offers a bold new vision of society where everyone thrives, regardless of how one fares in the genetic lottery. I will end with the further and effusive praise of the inimitable David Epstein who writes, to me, the aim of genetic research should be threefold, to find out which differences between people are real, which of those matter, and how to use that knowledge to get the best outcomes for all people. This fascinating book is a step towards that goal. We've got a lot to learn this evening. So without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Paige and Ben. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, for spending your, I, I heard it snowing there, your snowy Boston evening with, with us, um, for those of you who are local to the Harvard area. Um, ben and I have talked about this. Uh, we're going to structure this so that I'm going to, um, I've got nine slides, which hopefully I can get through relatively quickly, just to summarize the book's key themes for those of you who haven't read it yet. Um, and then we I, are hoping to have a, you know, a fairly free-flowing conversation. Um, uh, ben has questions for me and then also uh, audience Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And is that showing up for everyone appropriately? Yes, awesome, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start by rewinding actually um, 60 years. So I wanna start with a quote from Theodosius Stobjanski who was writing in Science in 1962 um, in a, uh, an article called Genetics and Equality. So you can already see why I've been quite influenced by this paper. And he, in the first page of this paper, 
um, summarizes two things. He says, let us make two assumptions. One, a generalization of biologically ascertainable facts. The other, a frank value judgment. People vary in ability, energy, health, character, and other socially important traits. And there is good, though not absolutely conclusive evidence that the variance of all these traits is in part genetically conditioned. Conditioned, mind you, not fixed or predestined. The second assumption is that genetic diversity is mankind's most precious resource, not a regrettable deviation from an ideal state of monotonous sameness. The problem is then not how to suppress genetic diversity, but how to utilize it in a manner both socially advantageous and in accord with the ethical principles which we hold binding. So there's a lot of different ways to summarize my book, but I actually think this might be the best one, which is that I'm picking up Dobjansky's challenge 60 years later and reviewing now that we have amazing technologies, statistical computing, the ability to, to measure the human genome directly, um, does his conclusion that people vary in these traits and that variance of these traits is genetically conditioned, how does it hold up? And then the second is to take up his problem of what do we do with that information? How do we utilize it in a manner both socially advantageous and in accord with the ethical principles which we hold binding? And here there's obviously a difficulty and that not everyone has the same ethical principles. So I'm very much approaching this book in terms of well, which ethical principles do I hold binding? What are my value judgments? Um, and trying to be transparent about those as well as my reading of the science. So um, what are, what let's, if we can kind of summarize the book and those two domains. Um, first is a set of is claims, things that I think are empirical conclusions that could be challenged with readings of the data, biologically ascertainable facts. And the second are a, a series of ought claims, things that are really value judgments that I, that I am bringing to the table and in interpreting the science. Um, okay, so for biologically ascertainable facts, the first is I'm just beginning with the premise that genetic differences between people make a difference for their physiology, psychology, and behavior. And you'll see, I've already wandered into controversy here by using the word cause here, that genetic differences between people cause them to be different. We can talk about this more, but I'm using an idea of causes as probabilistic difference makers. So if your genes have been different, on average, the probability that your traits would have been different um, two. Second is that most children in high income countries go through the process of formal schooling and schooling preferentially rewards some characteristics over others. Children who have an easier time with their working memory, who have faster processing speed, who have fewer ADHD symptoms, who are morning people, girls who go through puberty later, they tend to have an easier time in school. Um, and we can talk about whether that has to be the case or whether that's fair. But on average, um, you know, certain children find school easier than other children. These traits are neither necessary nor sufficient for doing well in school. And we can certainly think of children who are deprived of educational opportunity. Um, but given good enough schooling, we see that children who are quick at manipulating information in their head tend to do better than children who are not so quick. Um, so given that most of our psychological and behavioral differences are to some extent influenced by genetic differences between us, and given that school very deliberately and cumulatively selects, rewards certain characteristics, we probably shouldn't be surprised to see that by the end of formal schooling, and actually much before that, measured genetic differences between people come to be correlated with educational differences between them. Now, there's other reasons other than the process that I've just described, why genetic differences between people might be correlated with education and figuring out how much of this is genes are causing something about a person's development that then is operating through formal schooling versus picking up on some other process is an interesting and difficult scientific challenge, which we can talk about. But the observation that there are measured genetic differences between people that are correlated with how far they go in school is from one perspective about what we know about genetic influences on psychology and behavior and the way that schools work, not particularly surprising. 
And then last, why is this relevant for social inequality? It's that education, particularly in the US, particularly right now, structures access to many other things that we care about. So it's not just that people who have completed more formal schooling in America make more money, although that's certainly true, but they also live longer, healthier lives, report greater psychological well-being, have lower burden of mental illness on average. So when we think about the sorts of things we care about in midlife or late life, how healthy are you, how happy are you, how secure your material resources, education is increasingly a dividing line between people who are doing well on those dimensions versus people who are suffering in one or more of those dimensions. Some more ascertainable facts. So measurements of human DNA, they tell you something about a, a person's biology, but they also are telling you something about a person's environment. If I measure your children's DNA, well, they got it from you. So measuring your DNA or your children's DNA is telling me something about you as parents and it's correlated with the environments you're providing to them. It's correlated with environments that are correlated um, with genetics by virtue of the kind of the long arm of human history. So things like um, what uh, many geneticists refer to as population structure, sociologists might refer to as dynastic effects or class. So often when we're looking at correlations between measured genetic variants and education, it can be difficult to disentangle. Is this telling me something about a person's biology or is this telling me something about a person's environment? Um, also, people's biology can influence them via their environment. So for instance, a child who is biologically predisposed towards greater ADHD might provoke harsher discipline from his or her parents, which might then in turn um, precipitate the development of further conduct problems and behavioral problems. Is that a genetic influence or an environmental influence? It's neither, it's um, genetics via the environment. Um, genetic research uh, does not inform us about the causes of racialized disparities in health, education, um, or mental illness. Um, this is, I think, one of the most common misperceptions about what genetics is doing. And when we're talking about genes and we're talking about inequality, it's almost impossible for people to not talk, think about race, and particularly when we add education into the mix. But for a variety of reasons, which we can talk about in the Q&A, the research that's been conducted thus far is really focused on individual differences within people who are highly homogenous with regards to their genetic ancestry. Most of the times these people would be socially identified as white in the US and the research is not really getting at what many um, sort of extremists have, have proposed, which is that it's, it's not supporting a kind of a genetic explanation of race differences. And then finally, I think it's important to point out that genetically associated inequalities are no more or less immutable or intervenable than environmentally associated ones. I'm very glad that Ben um, is here with his eyeglasses because he's gonna play into the classic thought experiment about this from the economist Art Goldberger. Um, he might have a genetic predisposition towards poor eyesight, but we have ameliorated that as a society, not by CRISPRing his genes, not by selecting his embryo, but by giving him an environmental environmentally mediated intervention that he wears on his face, which is his eyeglasses. So given that we have this situation in which um, genetic differences between people come to make a difference for their lives um, in large part or in, in uh, one major mechanism for that is how it affects their psychology and behavior and how that plays out in the context of formal schooling. We psychologists, and I was trained as a developmental and clinical psychologist, have a problem, which is that we're often interested in trying to figure out specific things that parents or schools are doing that affect children's lives. Um, but those parents are also giving children their genes. And so trying to figure out what causes what in child, child development um, is a difficult problem and that kind of only gets more difficult the more that you think about it. Unfortunately, a lot of research in developmental psychology and clinical psychology and sociology and education and related fields, fields that are really focused on, again, understanding what, what specific potentially targetable, potentially modifiable factors in a child's environment 
is are you know are making a difference for their psychological or educational development. A lot of that research overlooks the role of genetics, and that makes causal inference that much harder. I think this problem would be less worrisome if we psychologists had an amazing track record of developing interventions that um, are really successful and making a difference in children's lives. But currently, most psychological and educational interventions that are tried um, don't work. The median effect size is zero, or the modal effect size is zero. I think recently there was a really um, interesting but frustrating sort of example of this, which was a large scale um, study of a randomized controlled trial where low-income children were randomized to preschool in the state of Tennessee. Um, a lot of researchers were expecting to see when those children were followed for several years that the availability of preschool would have improved their academic and behavioral development. That's what we would expect based on older studies such as the high school peri preschool program. And in fact, researchers found the opposite, that um, enrollment in pre-K for low-income children in this Tennessee program actually resulted in a long-term um, negative impact on behavioral problems and um, academic test scores, which you know, not only surprise people, but I think really is an eye-opening example of how little we know about child development when we can't even predict whether or not preschool is gonna have a positive effect or negative effect on their lives in just a few years. So that's my collection of um, is claims in the book. Um, and then I follow up by talking about a number of value judgments. And these are really coming from my personal political and moral values. Um, and the first is generally I'm coming from a, a, from a perspective that equality is good and egalitarianism is good. Inegalitarianism is not good. Um, my definition in the book of egalitarianism is borrowing from the political philosopher Elizabeth Anderson. I love this definition that she gives. I think it's very clear. So we're in egalitarianism is the idea that a social order, it's just and necessary to base that social order on some hierarchy of human beings. And this hierarchy could be defined by sex or by race, or in the case of eugenics, by um, something quote unquote genetic. Um, and that it is that hierarchy of inferior and superior people that then generates these inequalities and in freedoms, resources, and welfare. So to go back to Jansky's call to think about how do we use genetics in a way that um, is, is consistent with the, with the um, ethical principles that we hold binding. Um, it was important for me in this book to explore how can we think about genetic differences between people, genetic differences between people that matter for their lives, that matter for things we care about, like education, in a way that's consistent with egalitarian principles. Um, the second is, I think that we ought to care about inequalities in life outcomes that are associated with genetic differences between people. We're very accustomed to thinking about, um, and by care, I mean care scientifically as an object of legitimate scientific interest but also of political interest. So we're very, very used to this in an American political concept um, uh, landscape of thinking about how do differences in say education or psychopathology or labor market participation differ by the family resources in which um, a person was born. So that accident of birth, that is the social circumstances in which we were born, how does that play out? How does that structure your opportunities? I've been very influenced by the political philosopher John Rawls and thinking that we should apply the same political and scientific care to thinking about inequalities that are related to another accident of birth, and that is which genetics you happen to be born with. And so in Rawls' words, once we're troubled by the influence of either social contingencies, such as being born to a rich or poor parents, or natural chance on the determination of distributive shares, we are bound on reflection to be bothered by the influence of the other. From a moral standpoint, the two seem equally arbitrary. The third value judgment I bring into the book, um, which I didn't think was controversial until, I, until it came out and I'm realizing is more controversial um, than I'd realized, so maybe this is a point of discussion, is that I think the policy and intervention efforts to improve human lives and particularly to improve children's lives ought to be informed by empirical knowledge, the best possible empirical knowledge we can have about child development. And then finally, I've been really influenced by thinking about um, 
what we might think of as examples of anti-eugenic legislation in the United States and um, more generally by a disability justice perspective, which holds that society ought to recognize and accommodate human differences regardless of their cause in order facil to facilitate people's equal participation, equal enjoyment and equal dignity of the goods of society. So if we think about what the ADA requires of a building, if you've been into a public building, it requires that architectural barriers to people's equal enjoyment and participation of this space be removed. And what's interesting about that is that equality under the perspective of the ADA doesn't mean treating everyone exactly the same. If you built a building and you said, well, everyone has to go up the set of stairs, that would not, that sameness would not be enough to ensure equal participation or equal opportunity. It's, so it's not blind to differences in human functioning. It recognizes them and accommodates them. And so what's equalized is people's, again, people's ability to participate in a space. So if anything, if you, you know, if you read my book, what I'd like for you to walk away from it thinking about is what if we took that same perspective, that ADA perspective to designing our structures, but not just to our physical structures, vis-a-vis -vis differences in physical functioning, but to our economic and political and educational structures, vis-a-vis -vis differences in psychological functioning. From the perspective of the ADA, it does not matter if you cannot walk because of a congenital deficit or because of an accident that was your fault versus an accident that wasn't your fault. The cause of it is irrelevant to your claim on society. Um, as uh, a scientist, but also as a politically active human, we spend a lot of time in this kind of major nurture debate about what are the causes, environmental or genetic, of people's differences in psychological functioning. I think that debate is, is important and is interesting scientifically, but I'm also interested in how can we move, really move beyond that to think about what are people's claims on society, regardless of the causes of their differences in psychological and behavioral functioning. So I'm going to end there and uh, start talking to Ben and hopefully we'll have some good Q&A in the chat. Sounds good. Thank you, Paige. Um, before I get started, I just want to take a moment to uh, reflect and remember on Lyndon Eaves, who sadly died this week. Um, Lyndon, I think there are a lot of ways of describing Lyndon, um, certainly a pioneer of behavior genetics and amongst its most prominent um, intellects. Uh, his work is foundational for any number of the sort of elements in the book and for twin studies and for even probing genetics of things like social attitudes and you know political affiliation as at least in part being potentially shaped by genes at least in in some way um, and and I think you know Lyndon looms large as a figure and I think the world is diminished with him no longer in it um, but he he did have a lot of interesting and penetrating insights about thinking about you know behavior genetics and thinking about how we set about trying to partition variants, which I think is another thing that is coming under attack as well. Uh, and in, indeed, his paper in, I think, 1976 in Heredity about cultural transmission and trying to formalize the notion of what happens to a trait when there is cultural transmission and what that means in terms of how we measure it and how we look at it is resonates quite deeply with the ideas in the book about how your genes may shape your own experience, but they may shape your parents' behavior and that may shape your experiences as well. And, and so it's fitting. I think that Paige and I are gonna have this conversation now. And, and I think it's a, a testament to the penetrating insights from Lyndon from you know a long time ago. And reading that paper today, it feels just as current and just as relevant to the conversation that we're having societally about how we fit in genetic information into the world around us in terms of how it operates and how, how, it, how it goes. So with that you know, slightly long-winded introduction, I guess the first question for you, Paige, is the way you set the book up, you sort of have this moment where you and you know, Eric Turkheimer don't think that GWAS is going to work. And then you like set you, you know, it comes to a, we were wrong, like, you know, and, and like that, that, is, that sort of 
transition moment. Can you walk me through how you arrived at that? What shaped your mindset about that? And maybe we can talk a little bit about twin studies as well, because that's another way of probing these kinds of questions. Yeah, that's such an interesting point. So for those of people who haven't read the book, Eric Turkheimer was my PhD mentor at um, the University of Virginia. And he gave a very um, famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, uh, presidential address at a meeting at the Behavior Genetics Association, which is always a fun, pretty boozy dinner at a nice restaurant. Um, and not necessarily the time where uh, ordinarily someone tells many of their assembled colleagues, I don't think that any of the science you're doing <laughs> right now is, is very worth doing. So it was a very memorable talk for, for many people. Um, and that was, um, you know, I had been trained as a Turkheimer student. So I, I think I had come to thinking about GWAS from that place of extreme skepticism. Um, and, I, and also not just my kind of my training in the Turkheimer lab, but also if you think about what was happening in psychology at the time in terms of the replication crisis. So realizing how many of our findings, not just in genetics, not just in clinical developmental psychology, but, but across branches of psychology, um, even if researchers did the exact same thing, couldn't find evidence that that effect replicated, um, which filtered into, you know, psychological genetics and behavioral genetics in terms of the candidate gene paradigm. So I was really, you know, I, that, that moment, um, you know, I guess that was Marseille. So that was like 2014, 2015. In that moment, I was still thinking, you know, the jury's out on whether or not um, if you compile enough people, you can find something that replicates. And I think with that, I was wrong. I think, um, you know, I, I think many of the, um, the scientific practices that people have advocated for in the wake of the replication crisis in psychology, people in genetics were very early adopters of in terms of pre-registration, in terms of independent replication samples, in terms of stringent controls for multiple testing. And so I think a big part of that shift for me um, was not really around GWAS per se, but, um, you know, is <laughs> basically are the, are the many of the things that we've put into place to try to build a more replicable science, are they actually going to work? Or are they going to be successful? So I think that was one big part of the shift. Um, and I think the other reason I was kind of biased against GWAS to begin with is that as a psychologist, we spend so much time thinking about measurement. And I particularly have always been kind of a measurement head. Like I, I want to, you know, when I have my participants come into the lab, they don't get one brief executive functioning battery. They get 12 executive functioning tasks that we put together. And where GWAS is definitely, you know, and especially initially moving in the opposite direction, which is we might sacrifice measurement depth just for sheer sample size. And my prior about that was, oh God, that's never going to work. Like, what you know these are kind of garbage survey questions like where are we going to go with that um and so i think i was really surprised at um at that that sacrificing quality of measurement but adding these other um kind of reproducibility practices really did move the needle in terms of, of finding replicable associations yeah, but that exact same debate happened across medicine, right? So I, I come at it more from the kind of working on genetics to learn about human diseases and a lot more in the, the medical space. These debates were had about type two diabetes versus doing some sort of HOMA IR, like really fancy blood glucose response curves. Those, those measurement questions are not just specific to psychology, but also yeah. like present in a lot of other parts of the, yeah. the world. And, and there are people that get really attached to the like, deeper measurement about a few people will teach you a lot more and the humility of genetics is you know that bad measurement but done on everyone in a consistent way can can maybe teach you something but it obviously doesn't teach you everything that you want to know and and i think that relates to the kind of <clears throat> other thing in the book that i kept coming back to which is you know what's in the prs what do you i mean what do you <laughs> think is going on like yeah. you know your, your definition of probabilistic cause 
I think almost obfuscates that there is a genetic variant that is doing something biologically, at least for some of these loci, and that is what is going into the PRS. And, and so how, how do you think about that piece of it? Because I don't know, it, it's simultaneously the most interesting and perhaps the most difficult. Yeah. So, so I will say, just to back up, like just thinking in broad terms, like some part of it is not is not about the individual's biology at all, right? So like some part of the PRS is population structure or genetic nurture or like whatever you want to think about it, right? Like the part that, um, you know, the extent to the, the association between a polygenic score and um, an individual's outcome is diminished once you, for instance, condition on the parental genotype. So there's some stuff that has nothing to do with the individual's biology. And then I would say that, you know, we're, we as a field, you know, speaking really, really broadly, and in me in particular, um, on much firmer ground when we're talking about the relationship between um, psychological intermediaries and performance in school than between genes and brain or brain and psychological intermediaries. So I'm really comfortable with, with, you know, asserting the claim that some part of this is going through, um, you know, visual spatial reasoning skills, processing speed, working memory, and then the suite of sort of personality characteristics that we reward in school, right? So conformity and organization and, you know, intellectual curiosity. Um, but you're totally right. The like, how do you get to those from the genes um, is very, very unclear. Um, and, and some part of that might also be thinking about it in terms of developmentally. Like, I think we're on much firmer ground saying this is how differences measured at age five get, you know, trans kind of, um, refracted through the educational system such that you have different academic skills at age 12 or different social, and, uh, um, economic attainments at age 30, but that conception to age five. Is I think really really hard at this at this point in time, um, and you know even the stuff that we thought we knew. Like I finished the the draft of this book in two thousand. Um, I actually turned in the manuscript the day my children's school shut down for the coronavirus pandemic. So that's kind of a good benchmark for how long it's been since I wrote the book. And even since then, you know, just thinking about iterations of the educational attainment GWAS, how their bio annotation results have changed. Right, like so is it is it genes that are preferentially expressed prenatally or is it things that are expressed not preferentially prenatally? Even that has changed in like the two years since I finished, you know, as we, as we reach the junior year of the pandemic and the junior year since I wrote the book, even that knowledge has changed. So I think that's a lot more of a, like a black box. Um, I mean, I actually would love to get your take. Like, what do you think is in it? Like, <laughs> what's your, good what's question. your sense I, of this? I, I, I mean, so, so... So, so I guess I, I guess there are a couple of example traits that I like to to kind of talk about where things are a little bit more tractable, yeah. and like so, vitamin D levels has had a really really big GWAS. I'm not involved in the really big GWAS, but but if you look and go down the list of what's in the GWAS, at the top end you get things that are around skin, things that are around liver, things that make a lot of proximal sense for what I would describe as vitamin D metabolism. But then you get into the polygenic tail. And the polygenic tail is indexing things like, do you have a job that means you're going to spend time outside or inside? Or are you going, you know, like those sorts of things that really have a material impact on how much vitamin D that you're going to be getting, but are much less, you know, in a sense, biologically leveraged, at least to have a more distal causal chain from genetic variant to the apparent association that we're observing between those kinds of GWASs. And, and I think that that's kind of true of a lot of GWAS, where we know more going in. Like part of the problem working on the brain is that our neuroscience is nowhere close to where our immunology is. Like yeah. the joke is, is that like immunology is really complex. And I'm like, have you seen neuroscience anybody? <laughs> I mean, like, I don't yeah. know. So, you know, and, and so we're kind of starting from a further behind place in our annotation and understanding and interpretation of the biological processes that are involved in these neural phenomena. 
And we still have the same problems that everybody else has, which is like interpreting GWAS is still super difficult. We don't know how to map from genetic variant to gene very well. It's probably trying to teach us something about where and when this genetic variant might be doing something, but we're not smart enough to figure it out yet. And we don't have the data necessary to kind of realize that. Yeah. Nevertheless, the top end of schizophrenia still looks more to be involved in stuff in the brain, right? Yeah. And like, yeah, it's and that's not, how education is too. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, know. that's the sort of thing where, like, so if you think about, like, what are what are some like what is like in my mind like kind of one of the most consistent hits to get out of behaviorally, psychologically complexy, uh, normal range behavior GWAS and that CADM2, right? Which is like a cell adhesion molecule, right? And I'm, I'm seeing in the, um, in the chat that some people just want us to back up and talk about acronyms, right? So GWAS is a background genome-wide association study. So we're measuring lots of genetic variants that are scattered throughout all of your genome Oftentimes we're focusing on single letter differences between people. So Ben might have a T somewhere where I have a C and we are correlating them with some phenotype, which is height or BMI or blood lipids or skin color or um, how far you go in school to see, um, can we identify with some statistical confidence these specific variants that are correlated with our outcome of interest. And what Ben and I are talking about is the fact that you don't find one, you don't find 10, you find thousands. And the correlations are all really, really small. And oftentimes the SNPs are in genes or genomic reasons where we don't even know what they're doing. And so building a really clear biologically mechanistic understanding of you know, if you got results and it was like 10 genes and they were all in the same, they all were involved in the same protein, you'd be like, oh, that protein is really important. Um, we don't get that. We get these big, you know, sets of correlations that are all really, really tiny across hundreds of or thousands of rows. How do you make sense of that information? So that, that's kind of the background. Um, so to think about that, it's like, okay, well, what is that cell adhesion molecule doing in the brain um, in certain regions? But you almost immediately get to like a roadblock where kind of our basic neurobiological knowledge falls down. Like we did a paper on externalizing and, you know, did a bunch of fancy bioannotation analyses. And one thing that consistently came back is, well, genes associated with externalizing are preferentially expressed in the cerebellum. And then I go to my neuroscientist colleagues, of which there's many at UT and other places, and I say, okay, tell me about the cerebellum. And they say, oh, we never, we never image the cerebellum because it's really like, it's complicated. And like, we, we don't know what's, what's going on with that. And you just think, oh, well, you're just kind of going to hit a wall with genetics until these other kind of um, pieces of the puzzle are filled in a little bit better in terms of, of those other tools. Um, I, which is, I think, why I, I spend so much of the book thinking about, well, what can we do with it now? And that turns out to be more like a you know, as a control variable for studying the environment rather than as a, it is a tool for understanding biology in its, in its current incarnation. I, I agree with that. And I want to come back to that. But before yeah. we go, you know, the biology is, I think it, it's very important. I, it's certainly yeah. important in something like schizophrenia where I spend a lot of my time doing research because better understanding of biology, the hope is that gives us a new avenue to make new therapies because we haven't seen a new therapy for schizophrenia in 60 years, and that's pretty terrible. The other thing to kind of emphasize is it, so you, you talked about these bioannotation results, you know, various enrichment and results. I, I think the, the kind of broader point here is, you know, there's about maybe somewhere between 10 and 30 million common genetic variants in human populations. Um, a subset of these are what, and those are the single base pair changes that Paige was talking about. A subset of these are what we put into polygenic risk scores. So we like test every single one for educational attainment or whatever. And then based on the strength of association, we'll sum a subset of them up doing various things to create this kind of composite score that you're now wanting to use in the context of a control variable. And I think that that is a fantastic idea from a statistical power point of view, right? There's super clear value in 
can, of dealing with a set of variables that you know relate, but in some way that you don't now. But, but I, think, I think the concern or risk that I, uh, I perceive here is if we don't know what we're conditioning on, because you yourself have acknowledged that it is within the individual <laughs> yeah. or maybe within the parents or within the con you know, context that you're growing up, then does that give you a little bit of worry in the other side that like attenuating for these things may change the nature of what interventions relate through something like collider bias or some of the other statistical yeah, headaches yeah. that we run into? No, I think that's a really important point. And, you know, it's one in which it's a pro it's actually an old problem, right? Like, it's so a, a kind of a comparison or touch tone that I come back to a lot in the book is, well, what do we do with information about a child's socioeconomic status and their family of origin, right? So typically researchers will combine information on um, family income, parents' educational level, and parents' occupational status and kind of smush it together into this composite that we call SES, um, which actually has a really similar problem to apologetic score in which it's aggregating a lot of things about the child's environment, right? So there's the parents' education and everything that goes with parents' education, it's income and everything that goes with income, which are, um, only some of which is causally related and some of which is confounded. And also there's like a healthy dose of maybe genes in that mix of socioeconomic status. So um, I, I, I bring up the comparison with SES because I think that, that means that we can learn a little bit about what to do with the polygenic score by thinking about well, what do we do and kind of our how are we used to thinking about these variables and they're in the rest of social science? Um, so, you know, one kind of mental trick in a way is to think about, well, if whatever this researcher is proposing doing with a polygenic score, would it make sense if we substituted family SES for PGS in that context, right? So like, we are going to personalize education and track students according to parental SES. You would kind of have an intuitive, like, why would you do that? But also, like, there's good reasons to be like, well, but you could be wrong. And like, you'd be wrong in lots of cases. And the risks of being wrong are kind of outweigh the benefits of getting it right. And what are we going to do there? So I think it's something to, I think it's a, it's a, a problem we need to be aware of but also recognize that we're not coming to that problem entirely blind or entirely like devoid of examples of how to, to, to go about it thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense. Um, all right, I'll ask my last question before okay. we turn to the audience Q&A, which is, I, I think it's fair to say that there's been some controversy <laughs> around the book. I think, yeah. I mean, I've certainly seen some activity on Twitter and I'm just, I guess I'm curious about, you know, what the major areas of controversy you're experiencing and you're seeing and you're, you're getting in your, your position and, you know, whether there are elements that have hit home, like, have you changed your position about some of the things in the book? Have you thought about some of the other critiques about, you know, almost to the effect of, do we really need this book now for this part of the dialogue to change yeah. and improve education? I, I just curious about where you're, what you're seeing and how it's gone. Yeah, it's been really interesting. And I also think it's been interesting because the conversation is playing out in many different venues, right? So there's the kind of the media coverage, there's the social media response, there's the kind of academic um, reviews of it. But then there's also just like Amazon reviews or Goodreads or like the emails that I get and I get multiple emails per day. Um, and in some ways I feel like the, you know, the Twitter conversation is the least representative of how it's going. Um, because it's, you know, as usual, the most extreme voices, um, whereas I think like, I, I mean, this is just sort of fascinating to, to just like read the Amazon reviews, like there's like 400 of them. And most of them are positive, but to pick out some of them, you'd be like, did these people read the same book? Like this, these are such wildly divergent takes on something. Um, I would say that the thing that I've been thinking about the most is as a psychologist, you know, psychology, so much of it as a discipline is, is about individuals, is about individual differences. How can we understand um, what has happened to me versus what has happened to you to make our lives go differently? 
And I think politically right now, we're in this conversation where particularly in left-wing political spaces, um, the idea of, of um, incrementalist interventions that focus on the individual versus broad scale structural changes where entire institutions are, are reimagined from the ground up. Um, the polit like the, the um, I guess the, the cent center of like political conversation I think has moved much more towards the structural away from the individual. Um, and, and so what does that mean for the role of psychology? Like, what does that mean for not just genetics, but like for the role of thinking about the individual, for the science of the individual in terms of informing broader social conversations and intervention and policy? I think that's, I mean, that's a much bigger issue than my book, but I think my book, because of its inherent focus on the individual in relation to social inequality, it sort of pushed at that tension and has made me made me think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky space to operate in, but yeah, definitely. it's also what makes psychology psychology, right? Um, all right, so we've got a question about uh, twin studies typically assuming the effect of the common environment being the same for identical and fraternal twin pairs. And as you point out in the book, this isn't necessarily true. So in what direction does this assumption bias the results and how much is known about how large the bias is? Thank you, Murray, for your question. Yeah, so this is what people call the equal environments assumption. So the idea that identical twins aren't treated more similarly, just kind of qua being identical twins. It's actually been one of the most heavily investigated assumptions of twin studies um, in the past 30 years. Um, and to the extent the equal environments assumption is violated, we're gonna, um, misattribute stuff that's family environmental and put it wrongly in the genetics bucket. What I find as someone who's trained as a twin researcher and you know, still does twin research, one of the things that I find most exciting about the kind of molecular turn and the availability of GWAS data and genomic data more broadly is that it's kind of gotten us out of this kind of chasing around a tail conversation about the validity of certain assumptions about twin studies. Because we can look and see, okay, if we look at methods that have very different assumptions, are they triangulating on the same answer? And so I would say that, you know, based on combining twins and genetic information, the twins are probably overestimating the estimate of genetic influence, um, but it's still not zero. Like all of our methods are, are are um, converging on on the fact that Jansky was right that you know or Turkheimer was right that human individual differences in psychology and behavior cannot be entirely attributed to the differences in their environmental circumstances. I, I I agree with that. The direction of the bias also depends on what the truth is, and mm -hmm. you know if you have a G by E phenomenon which is like in some environments, this genotype will do something and in other environments, it doesn't matter. Like smoking and lung cancer, if there's no smoking in the population, then the genetic variants that influence smoking behavior won't have a look in on the GWAS of lung cancer. But if you do, they do. And so, you know, is that, is that genetics? Is that environment? Should the partitioning be the focus yeah. or should the like understanding the of yeah. the mechanism? Exactly. And, and I think that's also a point that maybe twin studies were a little too willing to give up on is that, you know, there, there's tremendous value in twin studies for, for understanding the impact of interventions, right? Like what better control than someone that shares exactly the same genotype? Like that is a brilliant control situation for an intervention, but it's really hard to make a leap from, well, we know genes matter and twins are related to what the mechanism by which those genes are expressing themselves. And that, that was perhaps one of the things I always found like just absent from the conversation yeah, in the twin yeah. research landscape was, was really truly a discussion of mechanism and the importance mm -hmm. of mechanism. Then again, Lyndon used to refer to people that did molecular studies as gene jocks. So maybe there's a little <laughs> bit about our, our community in there too. Um, so the next question's um, sort of about you know, I, I think this is more about your values rather than what's in the book, but it's it's kind of about this idea of access to opportunity in the context of limited resource availability. So 
you know, the example they use is stipulating someone that is four foot, five inches tall, must have access to playing basketball with taller people or, yeah. or not. But I, I think you get the general thrust yeah. of the question. No, I'm, I love this question because it's actually, because I, I, I love answering it. So I actually talk about the example of height and basketball players in my book. I talk about um, uh, a former player from the Dallas Mavericks who is seven and a half feet tall. And it was discovered that it wasn't because of a large effect size rare variant, but because he just had many, many, many common variants that were all associated with being slightly taller. Um, and if you talk about that, if I wrote a book that was, you know, this is why um, your genetics matters for your, you know, your height and why height matters for your basketball playing ability. And all, also, by the way, basketball players make a lot of money if they make it to the pros. I think that book would be considerably less controversial than the book that I wrote. Um, and that's because there's lots of ways to participate economically and socially and to share in political power if you're not tall and you're not a basketball player. So we don't set up basketball playing as a bottleneck to lots of other goods that we care about. Um, we do set up education and particularly a university education as that bottleneck. And I think when we think about bottlenecks, it gives us an opportunity to think about what is the thing that we're really interested in equalizing? Are we interested in equalizing basketball playing ability? Are we interested in equalizing height? Or are we interested in equalizing people's ability to contribute to a labor market and to be in a job that has some sort of you know, dignity and material floor and as a larger participation and feeling like they're a value to society. And I think it's that latter thing that we're more interested in equalizing. So for any, you know, I make this point that like, we've talked about, you know, there's already a long causal chain between gene to brain to some constellation of psychological traits to schooling. But there's also from schooling to labor market participation to, to how that labor market is set up to access to healthcare or access to social determinants of good health. And we can make decisions about how much we value equity kind of at every point in the chain. And I, I think this is a real weakness of a lot of our discourse about education in the US, which is that um, sometimes we conflate education as a good, as an end versus education as a means, right? Are we interested in equalizing everyone's, um, you know, everyone in the population's probability of getting a PhD in statistics? Like maybe not, like actually maybe what we're interested in is equalizing everyone's ability to get a job that has good access to healthcare, where they have control over their schedule, where they have dignified labor conditions, regardless of whether they got a STEM PhD, right? And, and so that's why I think the, the basketball example is a great example of when we can let differences shine because people don't have to go through that bottleneck in order to participate in society. But, but I think that also touches on exactly the other core tension, which is it's not just the discourse in the educational system. It is what education is trying to accomplish. Like yeah. some part of it is developing skills to exist in the world as a independent adult. Yeah. And some of it is an expression of self yeah. and they are conflated. And that I think caused it. And then, and then there's like status layered on top of all of that yeah, inflation yeah, yeah. that then further complicates the dynamic. And then even yeah. more complicated is the social cohorts and interactions, right? Like we've known yeah. each other for over a decade now. Uh, yeah. I mean, and uh, like that, that is another dimension of what we're in a sense talking about when we're talking about education yeah. and yeah. profession and those sorts of things. So yeah, challenging, I mean, challenging this issues. This also plays out. Oh yeah. I mean, I was just going to say like, the, this also plays out developmentally. Like our sense of what education is for when we're talking about elementary school, it's, it's like we're trying to get everyone to a core set of literacy and numeracy skills. Like that's what kindergarten is about. And we're much more comfortable with like differentiation and self-actualization as the goals at the extreme end, right? Like not everyone needs to get a PhD. I think part of our political debates are so acrimonious around high schools, selective high schools. Like there's debates in New York, there's debate in San Francisco. 
is because um, there's that tension about the different goals of education that smash up when we're talking about adolescents because they're like, are they like kids? Are they like adults? How much of this is they're striving versus how much of this is like a commitment to equity as in a public good? And so all of our differing intuitions and values about the purpose of education kind of meet when we talk about ninth graders. Um. So we've got a, another question about in medical genetics of disease, epigenetic regulation of gene function plays a very significant role. This is exactly what I said might come up in our little pre-meeting discussion <laughs> yeah. with some, some question about epigenetics. Um, could the discussants please address this issue in the domain of psychology and educational attainment? Yeah. Page, go um, ahead. Okay, so there, I don't even know if the word epigenetics appears in my book. It might appear a few places, but um, you know, I don't remember it. <laughs> we, um, I, as as you've already noticed, we we've, we've been talking so much already about how little is known about the biological mechanisms that are connecting genes and education, or even which genes are important, um, and the epigenetics of that we know kind of even less than. Uh, um, so in my lab, we do some kind of epigenetics -y research, which is around, you know, methylation, essentially. And we're just looking at that as another variable, like how do differences in DNA methylation, um, how are they related to environmental context? Um, so if kids are raised in poor neighborhoods or poor homes, like do they show methylation signatures that adults um, have been shown to be associated with diseases of aging or faster biological aging? Um, but even though they're in the same sample, like we're doing very little to integrate across the levels of analysis. So there's like the methylome and then there's the polygenic score, but I, there's no, they're not talking to each other, those levels of information. Um, so the short answer is like, not that much, like not, not that much. I'm not considering that much in the book because I don't think that that much is known um, at this point in time. And, and you know, I think that will be increasingly part of the conversation as as Ben was saying, as we move away from saying, well, genetics make a difference to how do genetics make a difference over time? For what it's worth, I think our poor understanding of epigenetic regulation in neurons and brain, like what little we know, is part of the reason that we're having a hard time interpreting non-coding genetic association. So where most of the genetic variants are falling that are relevant, that we think are relevant, they fall outside of genes and they are likely operating through some sort of regulatory mechanism that likely involves epigenetic regulation in some kind of capacity, be it methylation or histone acetylation or any number of other biological phenomena that have been documented, plus a whole bunch of others that haven't been documented yet that we just don't know about. And that is, I think, a big component of the, of the challenge that we don't, it's not even we're not even in a place where we know how we would be able to figure out what those genetic variants are doing just yet at this point, because there's still so much more that we have to learn about the genome and how it does its business. All right, last question from Anarud Patel, um, who says that they teach at Tufts and the students in my course found your spelling out the three big bad ideas of eugenics to be very helpful in terms of how those ideas differ from what you're talking about in the book. Uh, could you please recap those ideas for the audience? And I think I think that's exactly the right question to end on because <laughs> the anti-racist, anti-eugenicist yeah. agenda, which comes through very clearly in your book, is one that I certainly ascribe to and salute any effort to try and educate um, others about why being a geneticist is not the same as being a eugenicist. Yeah, and I'm seeing, page. I'm seeing that question. I'm so glad that your students found it helpful. I think I came up with that like for a talk and never wrote it down. So if what comes out of my mouth right now is different, is a different three big bad ideas of eugenics than you previously learned, I apologize if my, uh, if my off the cuff formulation, this is why I should, uh, should not just do talks, but actually formalize things in terms of papers. So one idea of eugenics is that, you know, eugenics is tying goodness and badness, value of people, to the genes, right? So they're projecting these value judgments into our biology that they're sort of inherently inferior and superior people. And we can reject that on both scientific and moral grounds. On scientific grounds, we see that 
genes don't conform to our value judgments about goodness or badness. So for instance, you see genetic variants that are associated with going further in school that are also associated with having a higher risk for schizophrenia. Is that a good variant or a bad variant? Like we, it doesn't fall neatly into those categories. But at the same time, I think we can reject on, on moral grounds this idea that there's inherently better people or inherently worse people. Um, and I, again, I think taking this disability justice mentality is really important. In my book, I talk a lot about the difference between valued and valuable and with regards to my, you know, one of my children struggles with a speech language impediment. You know, I can see that that being able to talk fluently to do what I'm doing right now is socially valued but that doesn't make one of my children more valuable to me than another one. Um, another big bad idea from eugenics was the idea that genetic causes could only be addressed using genetic changes or genetic interventions, and it made social policy worthless. And, and some, kind of, some, some part of this is this idea that like, ought applies, can, can't implies, don't even bother, right? So that we are sort of obviated from our needs to, to think about our social responsibility, to think about social equality if something's genetic. I mean, this is why I repeatedly emphasize the eyeglasses example. We can also think about this in a psychological realm. Um, how do I treat my child with probably a, you know, a heritable speech language disorder? He goes to hours and hours of speech therapy, which is this environmental intervention. Um, so um, the observance of genetic difference does not obviate our responsibility to thinking about um, uh, social change through social policy. Um, and then finally, you know, what were the horrors of the eugenics movement, right? And in the US, we can think of most infamously of the case of um, you know, Buck v. Bell, which held that it was constitutional, the Virginia involuntary sterilization statute, um, which was the idea that we could, we could limit the reproductive autonomy of people on the basis of their alleged inferiority. Um, and I think that idea that people's reproductive autonomy um, can be abridged or should be abridged is unfortunately something that's very much with us right now. I live in the state of Texas. This is a very active topic for us right now, not in terms of involuntary sterilization, but about reproductive autonomy generally. Um, and so I think thinking about anti-eugenics being not just about genetics, but also about preserving people's real ability to make their own reproductive choices um, is, is something that we need to be vigilant about even today. All right, well, thank you, Paige, for a lively and stimulating discussion. I'll turn it over to Benjamin to take us out. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, um, Paige and Ben, thank you for this fantastic presentation. Um, thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Please learn more about this book and purchase the genetic lottery at harvard.com. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, and be well. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Bye, thank you.